an abiding belief in a corroding libertarian individualism best characterises the contemporary left rather than the emergent and reforming right. For modern conservatism despises the destruction by target and audit of ethos and professionalism. It is completely committed to tackling vested interest and illegitimate hierarchy. And it views with horror the left libertarian denial of the norms of a decent civilised life and the codes of an abiding and sustaining community. What then is modern conservatism? What does it care about? What does it seek to conserve? Why, nothing less than society itself. The project of radical transformative conservatism is nothing less than the restoration and creation of human association the, and the elevation of society and the people who form it to their proper central and sovereign station. <coughs> Conservatism at its best has always been a care for the world and for those who live in it. Conservatives led the campaign against slavery. Conservatives such as Richard Osler and Anthony Ashley Cooper, the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, led the factory reform movement which campaigned throughout much of the 19th century against Guardian reading Manchester liberals for a reduction in working hours for women and children. In 1867, the second great reform bill under Disraeli was far more radical than that envisaged by Gladstone and increased the franchise by 88%. And in the 20th century, the Conservatives extended pensions and other forms of security under Baldwin. And in the 1920s, a much forgotten but a rather resplendent figure, Noel Skelton, terrified by collectivisation and influenced by Belloc and Chesterton, first spoke of a property-owning democracy, a tenant of fundamental and transformative Toryism, repeated by Eden and Churchill and Mrs Thatcher. The question, though, is what is the validity and merit of conservatism at this moment in time? Why should its message be heard? What does it have to offer? Well, simply put, and under the present leadership, I suspect it recognises that the old options are no longer viable. Both state and market have visibly and manifestly failed. And we cannot and must not return to the bankrupt version of either. If we British are to enjoy a better and more stable future, then we need a new deal and a new settlement. There are, I believe, three dimensions to this new deal, or new settlement. They are a civil state, a moralised market, and an associative society. Firstly, the civil state. There is much that is right with the state, and there is much that is wrong. What is right is that the state embodies in structured form a common concern. It represents the coalesced will of the people, that there is a level below which you cannot fall and an undertaking that we as a body politic have a stake, a cur, and indeed a provision for you and every other citizen. In that sense, the welfare state really does represent the best of us. In that sense too, the great triumph of the left is indeed the 1945 Labour government which laid the foundation of the modern welfare state. But what the working class hoped and thought would save and secure them has become something that very gradually and over time has eventually helped to destroy them. Why? Because the state, instead of supporting society, abolished it. The welfare state nationalised society because it replaced mutual communities with passive, fragmented individuals whose most sustaining relationship was not with his or her neighbour or his or her community, but with a distant and determining centre. Moreover, that state relationship was profoundly individuating. It's the key point, it's socialism that first produces individualism in its contemporary form. Unilateral entitlement, without appropriate return, individuated and replaced bilateral relationship. The working class did not ask for this. They wanted something far more reciprocal, more mutual, and more empowering. All existing working class welfare organisations were sidelined by a universal entitlement guaranteed by the state 
upon centralised accounts of need. Local requirements, organisations or practices were simply ignored and thus rendered redundant. Thus the welfare state began the destruction of the independent life of the British working class. The populace became a supplicant citizenry, dependent upon the state rather than themselves. And the socialist state aborted indigenous traditions of working class health, self-help, reciprocality and social insurance. Rather than working with each other in order to alter their situation or change their neighbourhood or city, relying on the welfare state only to get them through a temporary rough patch, working class people increasingly became permanent, passive recipients of centrally determined benefits. As such, welfare ceased to function as a safety net through which people could not fall, becoming instead a ceiling through which the supplicant class, cut off from earlier working class ambition and aspiration, could not break. This benefits culture can be tied directly to the thwarting of working class ambition by a middle class elite that formed the machinery of the welfare state, yes, to alleviate poverty, but also to deprive the poor of their irritating habit of autonomous organisation. <coughs> the new civil state would and will restore what the welfare state has destroyed, human association. This new civil state will turn itself over to its citizens. It will foster the power of association and allow its citizens to take it over, rather as it had originally taken over them. A new power of association could be delivered to all citizens so that if they are indeed in an area that receives public services in a form that can be identified by both sector and type, and if area-specific budget transparency is delivered such that each place knows what's being spent on it, then if those services are less than they should be in terms of quality, design or applicability, then there should be a new civil power of preemptory budgetary challenge. This would be given to any associative group that claims to represent those in its area, to take over the budget of that service so they can deliver what is required to those that need by those that care. So envisaged, this would allow citizens groups, if they meet appropriate and proper standards, of civic representation and organisational efficacy to take over the state in their own areas to be either commissioners of their own services or run them for themselves and each other. They could do this with welfare so as to tie local need to local provision and so make jobs for themselves where none existed before. Or indeed they could manage, run and own as an estate or specifiable area the services that had previously failed them, so that they would not fail themselves or each other. So conceived, the monolithic public state could gradually be broken down into an associative state for the public, where citizens took over and ran their own services so that universality would not be compromised, but in fact would be more achieved, as each particular need or area or would finally be in a position to meet that need by delivering, via this new power of budgetary challenge, the new associative state. Second area of a new settlement, the moralised market. The great paradox of the neoliberal account of free markets that has dominated discussion and determined practice, and indeed economic reality, for the past 30 years, is that in the name of free markets, the neoliberal approach has presided over an unprecedented reduction of market diversity and plurality. It has both reduced the type of provision available and the numbers of providers. In the name of freedom, we have produced economic concentration and in a number of areas, monopoly dominance, or indeed something very much like it. A perverse corporatism has produced industries that are too big to fail and consequently they have been made bigger again. The most obvious example of this is banking, where we have lost diversity, building societies, and subsequently plurality, all those building societies have now vanished, collapsed or been absorbed. 
where we have now only four major high street banks and the government's great pro-competition